My name is Jacob Mazur. I'm one of the programmers here at Bryn Mawr Film Institute. Uh, if this is your first time here, or if this is not your first time here, I uh, encourage you to pick up one of our programs. Uh, you can find these all over the atrium in the lobby, and it has a list of some of the other exciting programming we have coming up. But we have a great evening right here before us. Uh, this is the final film in our Science on Screen series. Tonight we will be talking about sports, sports psychology, what it takes to be an elite athlete. And we have a, 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 a kind of involved program tonight with, some, uh, with a couple different sections to you. So let me tell you what you can expect this evening. And I'm going to introduce our two amazing guests as well. Um, in just a moment, I'm going to call up Paulina Kozitsky, who is a former competitive gymnast, current coach at the Philadelphia Rhythmic Academy. And she's going to give us an introduction to rhythmic gymnastics in case uh, uh, anybody out there doesn't know the sport uh, so well. Um, we'll watch the film after that. And then once the film concludes, we're going to hear from Dr. Joel Fish, who is the director of the Center for Sports Psychology. And we're going to hear his perspective on the film from a professional sports psychologist standpoint. And then we're going to call Paulina back up again. And I, I, I believe that she'll have some uh, some questions and comments on the film too and we'll have a chance to talk about it with our guests. So with that said, let me please welcome up Polina Kosicki. Hello everybody. My name is Polina Kosicki. Uh, so how many of you here have heard of rhythmic gymnastics before? Wow, that is super impressive. All right, so I'm just going to do a brief overview of what it is. Um, it's basically a combination of ballet, dance, flexibility, um, coordination, lots of coordination, and strength. So with me today, I brought three apparatuses. I brought the hoop, the ball, the ribbon. Uh, and I'm just kind of going to demonstrate to you some of the movements that we do. As I mentioned earlier, rhythmic involves a lot of flexibility, so we'll do balances such as something like this. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, for basic beginners, we usually start out with something super simple, so something like a passe, and then we'll be on whole foot, and then we'll ask them to lift up onto releve, and then they have to stay basically on their tippy toes for two counts, and then that's a nice balance that we'll finish. Um, our warm-ups take about an hour just on the base floor of the warm-up. We'll do a bunch of like abs and then back warm-up and then doing some bridges, some splits. If I did a split, I don't think everyone would see it, so I'm not going to do it right now. Um, and then we kind of move on to some ballet at the bar. We'll do some plies, some grand plies, some batmans. And then we'll head on and do our um, elements from our routines just to practice before we start. And then for the next two hours, we'll be running routines. And that's pretty much kind of what it consists of. Thank you. 
We've just watched a film about somebody competing at the very highest level. And now we're going to have the chance to hear from somebody who works with athletes who are competing at the highest level. Dr. Joel Fish is the director of the Center for Sports Psychology. He's worked with uh, many professional sports teams and athletes, including the Philadelphia 76ers, the Flyers, the Phillies, uh, among many others, including gym, excuse me, including gymnasts. So please join me in welcoming him to the front. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you all for attending. And my hunch is you're feeling like what I am right now. My, my stomach is in knots. And sports psychology is about what do you feel? What do you think? And in those moments of competition, we got to see with raw emotion the sport part of sports psychology, which is the mental skills part confidence, composure, concentration, and the ability to perform such a precise routine under that enormous pressure. Wow, that's elite mental skills. That's the sport part of sports psychology. The psychology part of sports psychology is things in your personal life that may, can be impacting on your athletic performance. The dad being sick, relationships with the boyfriend, Obviously, the relationship with the coach and, and, the, and the administrator for the organization and just some random thoughts as I think back on my career having worked with a lot of elite athletes. And just to share with you my, my raw emotions, I was just struck by the, the personality change when she was with her boyfriend, for example, versus that stoic look when that administrator was talking to her. Where was all that feeling going? What was she feeling? What was she thinking? And maybe you were like me, I'm thinking at some point, really near the end, that emotion is going to burst out. And when she couldn't finish that last practice before the Olympics, I'm wondering, wow, what a well of emotion. Is it going to come out in her punching that person? Is it going to come out in her hurting herself? But underneath that stoic look, can you imagine what she must have been feeling, what she's thinking? That's what sports psychology tries to get at as it relates to performance. Just a couple observations based on my experience, and as Jacob said, 25 years working with elite athletes. Under the guise of mental toughness, and I see this with youth sport through the Olympic and professional ranks, Coaches sometimes, in a well-intentioned way, and I'm not excusing anything we just saw here, but building mental toughness can become the cover for abusive behavior. Oh, I'm not being abusive verbally with her or physically. I'm just building mental toughness. I'm just building character. And when we see that administrator and even her coach doing that, I've talked to many people who would say, I'm not hurting her, I'm helping her. And that's a major problem. When we see kids watching coaches on TV getting in the faces of athletes, those young people, who, coaches who are modeling after what they see on TV may be crossing that line, physical abuse, mental abuse, but no, I'm just building character. That's a real problem in our youth sports system which needs to be emphasizing effort and participation in skill development. What I see sometimes at the elite level that this really struck me with, and I love sport and I love fitness and recreation, is that in some sports, particularly those sports that emphasize body image and grace, gymnastics, ice skating, because there's a fine line between striving for perfection and being a perfectionist, as a licensed psychologist, I've seen many people struggle with that, and that can come out in eating disorders. That can come out in depression. That can come out in self-image issues, point number one, or another point. I've seen in the family dynamic situations like this, where very well-intentioned parents are saying, I want to give my son and daughter all the resources to be the sh best she can be. But that person, like Rita, 
may have a younger brother, older sister. I had someone in my office about a month ago that said, who was the younger sibling of someone like Rita, who mustered up all her courage and said to mom and dad, you keep talking about me leading a normal life. How am I supposed to live a normal life when I'm being dragged every weekend to tournaments? So there's a family dynamic that's underneath this that to me, we just got a glimpse of in this, in this movie here. That idea of mental toughness meaning more is better, tough it out. The number of injuries I've seen in gymnastics and other physical sports by the time participants are 13, 15, 18 years old is, is staggering to me sometimes because there's still a mixed message sometimes given to our athletes about suck it up, if you will. No pain, no gain, if you will. And there are some attitudes in our sport world that we saw here that are often part of, I think, what the development is. One or two other remarks. And I'm a parent, too. The role of the parent when you have a very talented child is not so simple. And it's really easy for us to say to parents sometimes they're going overboard. They're living their life through their kid. But in our day and age, it's really uncharted territory sometimes as a parent. How do you give your child all the resources to be the best she or he can be? Even though that you know the environment out there may be shark-infested waters, as somebody said. So sometimes I think it's really easy for us to see in someone else. Well, why would that parent allow that? But I really have worked with, and I ask us to try to understand that competition in 2019 is different than 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And there's no guidebook sometimes for how to advocate for your child, how to intervene with a coach, when to challenge your child, when to let them stop. So as a sports psychologist, we do a lot with parents around elite athletes, and I've really developed a sensitivity to the fact that it's not easy. It's not easy to parent someone who has a special talent like that. And the last point I'll make, because a very, very powerful film, and I was surprised, like many of you may have been, that the outcome is she wins the gold medal. Well, at what cost? And for those of us in our own lives, you know, what's the cost that we pay to achieve? And achievement and competition in our culture, I think, is really changed over the time I've been doing this work. Whether it's nostalgic or not, I think we used to say, it didn't matter whether you won or lost, it was how you played the game. And whether Vince Lombardi really said it or we just attribute to it, there is steeped in our culture, in our academics, in our athletics, in our work life, winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. And at what cost does that come? And for those of us in our own lives and those of us the parent or work with other people, I can just tell you that there's evidence up to the ceiling that to create a well-balanced personality effort, participation, skill development. There's a difference between striving for perfection than being a perfectionist. And I still love sport, I'll finish with this. Sport's a fantastic arena to learn life skills. I, I, sport, fitness, recreation, the way it can teach youth ourselves. Goal setting and grit and perseverance and you can't always get what you want and teamwork and striving. Those are wonderful life skills. Sports still remains a terrific place to learn life skills. But what this film really brought to my attention in a very powerful way, just because we put a uniform on someone, just because they are trying to accomplish a goal doesn't guarantee they're going to get those life experiences. And one of the first questions that I ask whenever I'm doing a group like this, can you think of your, your earliest competitive memory? We all have them. And for half of us, it may be really, really positive. And for half of us, it might be something that we could relate to to this. Sports remains a wonderful way to learn life skills. And we all are challenged to try to find a way to make sport, fitness, and recreation part of a healthy lifestyle. That's something we are continually working towards and is a work in progress. And the goal, though, of how to integrate sport and fitness and recreation in a healthy style is one that's really worthwhile for us. So thank you for listening. I welcome the chance at the right time to answer any questions that you have. 
And Jacob, thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you. So it's not often when we watch a film like this that we have a chance to talk to somebody who has, uh, you know, worked and competed in uh, similar uh, conditions, but we have one here. So Paulina, would you like to join us? Paulina. Yeah. You've competed in rhythmic gymnastics. Yes, I have. And now you teach rhythmic gymnastics. Yes, I correct. do. Can you talk a little bit about, A, how your experiences in the sport um, relate to, you know, those that we saw for Margarita Mamoun? And then if they are different, can you talk about, you know, some of the ways in which they're different and how you how you were taught and how you teach as a uh, as a rhythmic gymnast? Yeah. So as we saw, Margarita Mamoun, um, her practice schedules were very, very tough. She was constantly in the gym. As you notice, she said that she had AM practices and then afternoon practices, each about four hours a day. My practice schedules were a little bit different. Um, I trained here in America. I was on the national team for seven consecutive years in rhythmic gymnastics. And I would go to school, and then I would train for the next four to five hours from 4 to 9 p.m. My relationship with my coach, I would say, was actually pretty similar. I had a coach from Bulgaria, so she was from Europe. And her, her coaching was very similar to what Russia is put under. Um, very strict. She would challenge me mentally at times. But I would have to say that when she would say some harsh things, it kind of would make me angry and kind of want me to prove her wrong and show, no, I'm better than what you're saying I am. And in the end, it would make me a better competitor against my other gymnasts. Um, and then towards the end of my career, my mom actually became my coach. So that was a whole different coaching dynamic, mother, daughter, um, had its pluses and minuses as well, traveling the world together. It's always great to have someone to lean on. But during practice hours, whatever would happen in the gym would also sometimes be taken into home. And so if I would have a bad practice at home, it would kind of not give me good relationships at home and wouldn't be able to do a lot of things that I would have if I had a good practice. So how do you approach instructing your students in developing mental toughness and, and discipline? Yeah, so that's something I'm kind of working on. Um, I started off coaching the younger levels, so with them it was pretty simple and pretty basic. Um, they're not on <laughs> such a high level scale where they're really training so toughly. But now, for the past two years, I've been working with girls in level nine and level 10, and they're training to become members of the national team, trying to get themselves up there. And I kind of focus on, yes, I have to be strict with them at times, because if I'm not, the, they will slack off. Our sport is a lot of self-discipline, and you really have to work at it by yourself. We, they, The gymnasts have one coach, and there's about 20 gymnasts in a room at the same time. So when I'm working with one gymnast, the other 19 gymnasts have to be working on the side by themselves. I don't have 50 different eyes to keep an eye on everyone, so it's very tough. Um, but I make it work, and I really try and focus on disciplining them in the right way. I will, I will be harsh, but I will let them know when they're doing things the right way, and when they're doing a good job, I will applaud them for it. But when I see that they're not working their hardest, I, I will talk to them, and I will be like, listen, what's going on? What, why is today's practice different from yesterday's? Why are you slacking off? And sometimes they'll give me reasons. Other times they'll just say, I don't know. And it's very hard to kind of communicate with gymnasts this way. So I try and have an open communication between the coach and the gymnast, which is something that I didn't have so much of. And when I would go to competitions, I would notice all the other gymnasts interacting with their coaches in a loving way. And I would kind of have like just a coach and a gymnast, whereas the other ones had more of like a relationship in between. And I didn't really have that. So I'm just trying to build out with my gymnast right now. Well, thank you. Yeah. I, I expect that I'm not the only person in this room that has some questions for, for both of you. And so if there's anyone in the audience who has a question or a comment or a reaction that they'd like to share, uh, if you raise your hand, I'll run over to you with a microphone. Thanks. 
the um, the fact that she wins the gold medal seems to vindicate the administrator's behavior. But I guess what I'm curious, Dr. Fish, is is there any evidence that that kind of behavior actually, that kind of uh, coaching is actually productive in the real world? Well, I don't want to paint everyone with the same brush. And what I really got from what Pauline is saying is I really have to tap into the personality of the person and know when they need this, support, when they need challenge. Youth need discipline. Those of us that are parents know that they need structure. But I've worked at the highest levels it, in a lot of different sports. And there's a lot of athletes that before the big performance are going to perform best when you do this. Don't worry about it. Shake it off. It's okay. Are there some that are going to respond to this? Yeah. So you can find athletes who perhaps accomplish the goal with this kind of performance. But I know there's a lot of athletes who get weeded out of the system who have the potential to be, that don't reach their full potential because their personalities would respond better to a different kind of a style. But I can't paint everyone with the same brush, and that's really important for me to say. Um, what I do know that is that sometimes when you see as a parent a situation, you just see the winning the gold medal. You don't see behind the scenes. So for every ten, one that might make it and perform on that particular day, there might be 10,000 who don't reach their po potential because we think, oh, she made it because she had this kind of coach. That, to me, is a concern. Uh, Polina, from your experience, do you, th uh, do you know if there are athletes that drive themselves too hard that you kind of need to hold them back so they don't hurt themselves or? As a coach? Yeah. Um, I will witness gymnasts working very, very hard and pushing themselves to their maximum limits, and that's what I love to see as a coach. I have never yet seen a gymnast pushing herself to the point where she's literally going to fall and faint on the floor from running so many routines, but I have witnessed moments where the coach and the gymnast will not agree on something, and then the gym, and then the coach is very upset with the gymnast practice. So the coach leaves, and then the gymnast stays in the gym and continues working, even though the coach has left and has been disappointed. The gymnast is that disciplined that she's going to practice and practice until she gets what she didn't do in that practice. In, in my response to your question. As a term that's used for athletes, it could be gymnastics in any sport that is almost always rated as a negative term is, he's soft, she's soft. And so the response to an, from an athlete sometimes is to suck it up and just bear it, like I think we did with Rita. And she was able to hold it together, although at times we could see she was on the edge there. And she kept, she was told, don't shake, don't shake, don't shake. But in sports psychology, we try to teach some mental skills so that you're better able to manage your anxiety. Rather than don't do it, here's something you can say or do to manage it. Um, but the term soft is one that one will be avoided so often. And that allows, if you will, the abusive cycle to sustain itself. We saw, in my opinion, and I'm open to anything anybody else, a line that was crossed in terms of what we'd call verbal abuse. So how does that sustain itself? I'm building mental toughness. Oftentimes it's from the coach's end. I'm not soft. It's from the athlete's end. And this is a psycho licensed psychologist to me. If you're in that abusive cycle so often, it's so confusing. Like I was wondering, does she really realize that this is Abusive? Like, you could see how the coach, too, is buying into the system so much. And then I might see it one, three, five years later because abuse and tra trauma, you could say this was trauma, doesn't just go away when you stop competing. One, three, five years from now, it might come to my attention is depression. It might come to my attention is perpetuating the abuse onto 
someone, other significant person in your life? Getting back to your point, that, 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 that does it vindicate? I don't think the story stops here. I would be really interested in talking with her one, three, five, ten years from now. Look at the football players we're dealing with now who know concussion may be part of it, but listen to what some of their stories are. One, three, five, ten. Does, is it vindicated? That's a very complex question. How does your role as a gymnast map onto who you are as an individual? Uh, tough question, but... My role as a gymnast, um, honestly, gymnastics taught me a lot. Uh, it's a sport where you compete individually in front of a massive crowd, so you have a lot of responsibility on your back, especially representing the United States of America. For seven years, doing that, traveling the world, traveling the country, that was a huge uh, weight on my shoulders. But at the same time, it was very rewarding, very positive thoughts, very positive emotions whenever things would work out and I pushed myself to the limits and everything turned out correctly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I hope that answered your question a little bit. <laughs> so in the, uh, in the final moments as the, uh, the administrator was uh, being Skyped in and hurling her abuse uh, uh, over the uh, over the airwaves uh, it seems like there was a point where uh, where uh, Rita looked at her and just thought okay that's enough and uh, and and walked off and uh, and I, I don't know if she ended the practice there I mean the next thing we see she cut we you know we cut to her on a bus uh, and uh, but it, it seems to me that, that she reached a point where she just thought, well, to hell with you. And is, is, it, it seems to be that, that uh, at that moment she basically said, okay, I'm, I'm in charge now. Is, there a, is, is that something that, that, that uh, one sees a lot with, with people that they get pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and then at a certain point they say, okay, I'm seizing control of my own career and my own decisions. This is for me, it's about me. I don't care about you anymore. To hell with you, coach. I'm in charge. Is that, a, is that like a, a necessary sort of fledgling step for, for elite athletes in your experience? Um, in my experience, I would say that that definitely happens. I won't say though that the gymnast takes her career into her own control. But there are moments where you get just pushed to the limit. Um, I've had moments like this before, and I just need to t step out of the gym, go to the bathroom, have five minutes to myself to gather my thoughts together, and then come back in the gym and work my butt off because I know in the end that the coach is doing this for my benefit and that she's spending eight hours in the gym just as much time as I am, sitting there watching me do every step, correcting me on every little thing to point my toes, to strain my knees, lengthen my arms to catch this equipment. So she's putting in just as much work as I am, and like they mentioned in the film, the coach and the gymnast are a team, and without one or the other, you won't get anywhere. So I think, yes, there are moments where you will have disagreements with your coach, but just know that in the end that the coach is there for you and to make your career the best that it could be. Just to add, tough love can get results. You know, tough love is a motivator. And I'm sure we've all had someone in our own lives who was really demanding of us and challenging and maybe did bring the best out of us. But tough love can also have negative consequences too. And I happen to believe that more often than not, tough love o only on its own. Like to me, the coach had s sort of a mixture. She could be tough with her, but she could be loving at the same time. And I don't know about you, but that's why I felt more connected to the coach than to the administrator. If that administrator were my coach, I, I would have quit after a day. I don't know about you. And if that coach had been me at the right age, I, I could have hung in there with that. But the problem I see sometimes is that tough love on its own, well, that's just building character. And I just see the scars that, that really come along with that. And again, now, from my own personal experience, 
I've seen as many ath- elite athletes, and I mean, I'm calling any professional athletes, elite athletes, be very shy, sensitive, emotional, and I'm talking about physical sports like football, lacrosse, not just non-physical sports, and the art of coaching is really understanding the personality and the mix of challenge, tough love, but support too. That to me is great coaching and being able to figure out the mixture because one without the other, I think, decreases the chances that most of us are gonna be the best we can be. I was curious, um, excuse me, (coughs) from both of your perspectives, because that seemed to me to be a pretty extreme version of coaching, uh, or at least from the administrator, have you both of you seen anything consistently in uh what you would call both well balanced and successful high end athletes as far as coaching and the mental approach um or does that really come in all shapes and sizes as far as both how they achieve and then how they live as people well i can tell you things are different 10 20 30 years ago cuz i work with a lot of college athletes too and Sometimes coaches will refer to old school. She's old school. He's Well, that's more an old school, but this was an extreme approach, even from the old school approach. But I know now there's legislation, and I think it's positive, where a college coach couldn't get away with that anymore. That they would say, athletes need more communication. They expect, it used to be, you know, jump, and now they ask, and, and they would say, how high, and now why do I have to jump? So... I, I do think that our culture has some checks and balances into it that would prevent this from happening. Um, and I think that's a really good thing. And I think also coaches who are coming through the ranks now, this may be a cultural thing in America, most of them are being exposed to sports psychology, coaching different personality types, developmentally. What's the way to coach a kid when she's 10 and 12 because they're psychological changes too, physical changes. In a sport like this, where a, a woman and a, you know, where somebody's body may change from 10 to 12 to 15, like how do you, so I think the other reason, this is really even more extreme than it ever was, legislation, and I do think more coaches are being educated that to produce that well-rounded person, you really have to, kind of understand that person emotionally, and it's not just about X's and O's. Yeah, I would definitely have to agree. I would say that the coaching here in America is definitely very different from the coaching in Europe. Um, Just based off of international travels, I would see how um, Russia's teams would be coached by their coaches, and you could just hear them yelling from across the carpet, whereas American coaches, they will yell, Um, but not nearly to such an extent. Um, Again, as mentioned earlier, just because we we do have boundaries set here. Um, In Russia, it's a little bit different, I would have to say. But also, Russia is held to a very, very high standard. They've been number one in this sport for so long, so I feel like they're almost allowed this right to do it this way because they they have kept their position. And so something must be working for them. Um, But America is definitely making their way up there in the ranks for uh, rhythmic gymnastics, and I think that the way that we're coaching here is definitely working for us as well. Hello, thanks for being here with us. I was curious about the psychology of the um, teammate relationships, Mm -hmm. and especially because it's it's a team sport, but it's mostly an individual performance, thinking about there's the element of clearly sort of like survivor solidarity of being through something so intense together that requires so much dedication and fortitude, but also that maybe envy or jealousy when you're not the one who's successful this day, and um, just both of your perspectives on the complexity in in those relationships. I mean, to me, the, the closest thing is like a sibling relationship, you know, and think about a brother or sister you may have and it, it it's a, it's the storybook that we'd be a hundred percent happy and you know gra- 
why is she getting all the attention all the time? What about me is usually part of most of our narratives to some extent. So I compare this relationship that I saw here to sisters. And there's healthy competition and there's unhealthy competition. I, I saw elements of healthy competition here where they were really pushing each other to be better. Oh, now you're in the position I was in two years ago. Like I can, and nobody else in the world could relate to nobody except that. So I see that, but I see healthy, unhealthy competition too. Where, again, my identity is connected to whether I finish first or second, and it becomes a zero-sum game. You win, I lose. I win, you lose. That's what I would define as unhealthy competition. And like in a family. Part of this was exaggerated by the coach and that administrator that she was playing one against. Why can't you be like so? It would be like you saying the one child to another, so why can't you be like your brother or sister? So how the coach administrator handles that relationship, just like a parent to siblings, is really the key whether I think you have more healthy or unhealthy components to that. Yeah, I would have to agree with that as well. <clears throat> Having teammates there to support you is always amazing. Um, just going out on the floor, not doing your best job, and then coming back into the back of the carpet and continuing your practices with everyone else, it's just nice to know that, like, hey, someone back there is backing you up and saying, like, hey, like, that's okay. You made a mistake. Mistakes happen. You still have three more events to show yourself and prove yourself that you can do better. And that's always great to hear because not all the time is your coach going to say that because she's just going to be upset that you didn't do the best that you did from the practice the day before. Um, so that's always great. But at the same time, or no, not at the same time, um, in the end, you are competing for the same country. Um, especially at international competition. So in the end, it's it's more important on where you, the United States of America places than on your individual scorecard record. Yeah. Is it possible that she was so talented that she succeeded despite the coaching? Um, I would have to say no. I definitely think that the coach is there to push you to your max. She may have been talented, and talent is great and all, but in the end, if you're, this sport is all about muscle memory, so no matter how talented you are, if you're not practicing every day to your maximum, you're not going to be competing at your maximum. So you really need to put in those hours and have someone on top of you 24-7 telling you what to do, how to do this correctly. Uh, yeah, you, you definitely need your coach in this sport. <laughs> um, I'm going to take a mixed stand on that because why do some people, are they able to overcome adversity in their life, maybe poverty? You can have two people growing up on the same street, and let's define them as living in poverty, and one is going to rise above that and one isn't. I, I think there's an element of how we're wired that is really important towards us being able to be the best we can be. And my gut feeling is that she had some inner fortitude that allowed her to overcome that. And that's why I kept asking, you know, in psychology we're asking why. Why is she doing this? Why is she doing it? There was some internal drive there that we weren't quite given privy. We weren't quite, I think, led, uh, given information to understand that allowed her to overcome that. And then Again, but, but I, the psychology part of me is really interested in the fact that it was the day after the administrator probably administered the lowest blow of all. Your dad is dying. Like, go out there like you're praying. I mean, that to me was, was the lowest of the low. Did she respond to that short term? Wow. Like, maybe, did that influence her performance? like her ability to be herself, 20, maybe, <laughs> but long term, is that um, a motivational technique where there are going to be many, many more traumatic costs than that short term victory? Yes, I would say that. So I'm never sure it's 100% one way or another you overcome it, but I do believe there are some people that are wired 
to be able to handle pressure and have a motivation to overcome an obstacle, including a coach. Um, how does uh, a sport like rhythmic gymnastics that, uh, I mean, it, it obviously requires a kind of emotional component, right? But also like a very stringent physical component. And uh, the coach and the, um, the manager, the program director, um, was talking about uh, at, at once divorcing oneself from emotions, but also living in them. Um, I mean, how how does that? Uh, how did how did first of all like you navigate that like performance, but also uh, like demanding physicality, and how how does that um, uh, how, how does that affect like the mental state of the sport? Because I know like I've I've competed not anywhere near that level, but I would always sort of divorce myself from it emotionally, but I guess you can't really do that on a level. How does that work? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely really, really hard to do so. Um, but in the end, like I mentioned earlier, it's all in the muscle memory. So when you go out on the carpet to perform in front of hundreds of people, you're kind of almost shocked at first and you kind of like forget everything that went on. So that's why it's super helpful to have all of those hours of practice in because you're just focused on the physical side of it and just on performing what your muscles remember how to do. Do the toss high, throw it in the correct direction, catch with the long fingers in the correct spot, always be there. And then once your competition ends, once you do all four routines, then you kind of go back to your emotional state and let everything just like kind of sink in. And I would say there are individual differences there, clearly. A lot of the term we use in sports psychology is how to learn to be the calm in the midst of the storm. In other words, I really believe it's, it's a skill-building quality that we can develop to be on that big stage but still be in control of your emotions rather than your emotions controlling you. So it's, but there's a lot of skills connected to that. What am I feeling? What am I thinking? Are my emotions too high, too low? If they're too high... That's why I was interested in those deep breaths. <sighs> God help me, positive self-talk. Like I would never say to an athlete in this situation, don't feel anxious, don't feel nervous. I know muscle memory is a big part of it, but we're not machines, we're not robots. So what are you feeling? Because I wouldn't want any emotion to be the enemy, anger, stress, anxiety. But if you are feeling that, what's your plan to be more in control of it rather than you it controlling you. That to me is part of the skill building that sports psychology speaks to. That's more the sport part of the sports psychology, the mental skills piece. Well, we're about at our time, guys, so please join me in uh, giving a big round of applause to both of our guests. Thank you for coming and for those questions. Thank you.